This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Do you believe in ghosts? Some people believe in them, others do not. Personally, I do. And I feel sure that when you leave this theater, you too will believe in ghosts. You've perhaps heard of the B-movie schlock extraordinaire William Castle. He was a filmmaker who rose through the ranks of Hollywood during the 40s and 50s as a film noir director, before falling into disillusion and moving on to finance his own independent horror productions that became famous for their technical gimmicks. For example, during the release of Macabre in 1958, each audience member was given a $1,000 life insurance policy in case they just so happened to die of fright during the film. For the 1959 creature feature The Tingler, Castle had movie theatre seats installed with vibrating motors that would activate when the film's star Vincent Price warned the audience that The Tingler was loose in the theatre. In 1960's 13 Ghosts, audiences received red and blue 3D glasses where they could only see the ghosts if they looked through the red. And in 1958's House on Haunted Hill, he had a skeleton float around the audience to mirror the on-screen actions of the film's climax. Ultimately, it was these gimmicks that solidified William Castle's legacy because his filmography, at least from what I've seen, left a lot to be desired. In fact, Castle was more of an elaborate showman who just so happened to be a competent filmmaker. However, in the case of House on Haunted Hill, if it weren't for Castle's gimmicks to get audiences in seats, we probably would have never have had Alfred Hitchcock's groundbreaking slasher Psycho in 1960. Because it was thanks to Castle turning this low-budget horror flick into a major financial hit that Hitchcock felt confident that there really was an audience enthusiastic enough for provocative horror movies that strayed away from the Hollywood escapism that dominated pre- and post-war cinema. And by extension, if it wasn't for the subsequent success of Psycho, there likely would have never even been a slasher genre. To think, one of the most important and profound pillars of the horror genre that cemented a legacy of monumental films and filmmakers may not have existed if it wasn't indirectly for the commercial success of House on Haunted Hill. It cannot be understated just how significant Castle's marketing gimmicks really were to helping horror find a home in the minds of mainstream audiences. Hell, it was the necessary clickbait of its era. Get butts in seats and once they're there, as long as you pander for a bit, you can pretty much tell whatever story you wanted to. Yet, rarely do people ever talk about the actual content within Castle's films. So what exactly was it about House on Haunted Hill that really held audiences' attention to see this big climactic gimmick? Well, that's why I'm here, to explore not only the horror behind the original 1959 cult classic, but probably more so to give you some perspective on the legacy that led to its incredibly bizarre 1999 remake. So let's get into it. As a broad summary, both the 1959 and 1999 versions of House on Haunted Hill are surprisingly very different films despite their identical setup. The story follows five strangers invited to a party at a supposedly haunted house situated on top of the literal haunted hill, where an eccentric millionaire and his wife offer each guest a large sum of money, permitting they survive the night. From there, your traditional old-school haunted house shenanigans commence, but where the original and remake begin to stray from each other is how they approach their scares. In the 1959 film, the actual hauntings are left open to barebones interpretation, while the remake is, uh, well, let's just say it's a lot to comprehend, but uh, we'll come back to it. The thing about the original is that it highlighted what kind of filmmaker William Castle was. Castle's filmography right up until he switched to horror was predominantly mystery and film noir, and technically House on Haunted Hill is not that much different. Yes, it's still a horror movie at heart with how much it sets up this eerie premise about the house's history of death and murder and the restless spirits that now haunt the place, but around the halfway mark it switches to a relatively abrupt murder scenario 
where the millionaire's wife is found dead from an apparent suicide, and each guest is left suspect without any clues or investigation to make you feel engaged in the drama. I mean, the film is barely 75 minutes long, so by the time it's taken its characters on a literal tour of the house recounting its morbid, violent history, there isn't much time left to play any sort of Agatha Christie guessing game, and instead it just becomes a series of things that happen rather than a creatively interwoven story with any sense of focus. However, despite its low budget and uninvolving plot, some of its imagery is legitimately effective for its time, and while it certainly has a reputation today for its campy quality that even inspired some of its later contemporaries, there is a quirky charm to it. Now, before I get deeper into narrative spoilers, as a comparison, the 1999 remake introduces a significantly more elaborate backstory that's surprisingly quite intriguing. For context, 1999's House on Haunted Hill was the first in a series of horror films by Dark Castle Entertainment, a production company by producers Joel Silver, responsible for action films like Die Hard, Predator, Commando and Lethal Weapon, Robert Zemeckis, responsible for helping to pioneer visual effects in Hollywood productions, although this film does anything but help, and Gilbert Alder, who produced the 80s Elm Street anthology Freddy's Nightmares, as well as films like... Uh, uh, Demon Knight and uh, D -D 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 Dylan Dog? Anyway, Dark Castle was originally set up as a homage to William Castle, with the premise of remaking his horror movies for new audiences. However, they almost immediately backtracked into producing their own original films instead that, generally speaking, had deeply cool concepts for modernizing old-school horror stories, but pretty much all of them suffered from lackluster execution during a time when the horror genre was going through a severe identity crisis. Hell, they even remade House of Wax, which isn't even a William Castle movie, but I can understand people mistaking it as one. In the case of the Haunted Hill remake, it actually has more in common with William Castle's other haunted house movie 13 Ghosts than its 1959 counterpart. In fact, when you think about it, it's very easy to confuse the Haunted Hill and 13 Ghosts remakes, because despite having different directors, they both have identical hyperactive editing styles and tell the same story about an evil haunted house locking everyone inside, as viciously violent ghosts chase the characters through a labyrinth while they search for an exit. I shit you not, Chris Kattan and Matthew Lillard play the exact same eccentric scene-chewing character who exists as both comic relief and providing exposition for all the hauntings, while F. Murray Abraham and Jeffrey Rush are both veteran actors hired to play similar eccentric millionaire antagonists. I have a theory that since both films were produced two years apart by the same studio remaking the same director's work, 13 Ghosts basically used a reworked version of the House on Haunted Hill script because since it did pretty well at the box office, they thought they could achieve the same return again and create some sort of shared universe or style type thing. Because the only true narrative difference between them is that they loosely shoehorn in Castle's distinct gimmicks like the ghost seeing glasses and, well, there is no skeleton in the Haunted Hill remake so I guess we have to settle on the Vincent Price pencil moustache homage, which was actually Rush's homage to filmmaker John Waters who was an avid fan of Castle's work but they liked it so much they went all in on the detail. Anyway, getting back to my original point, in the 1999 remake, instead of it just being a house with a history of murder, Haunted Hill was a former psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane, operated by a murderous surgeon who tortured and experimented on his patients before they broke free and torched the place, killing everyone except five staff members, a detail we'll come back to later. 
Today, that sounds ridiculously cliched, in fact for 1999 standards it already was cliched, but this setup is not only more interesting to keep you curious about the supernatural aspects of the story, but it does reinforce how sincere Dark Castle initially set out to be in terms of respecting older classical horror cinema. I mean, look at this creepy title sequence and tell me this style isn't indicative of early effects cinema. Additional credit should also be given to its production design because the interior and exterior of the house, despite how little we see of it, is a compelling mixture of gothic, classical and modern architecture. It's nowhere near as memorable as 13 Ghosts, but it's a visually unique setting nonetheless. The remake is self-aware of its campy charm, as the characters give relatively tongue-in-cheek performances, but when it comes to scares, it goes for this avant-garde approach of video-nasty provocativeness, which was a style that the film's director, William Malone, followed up even more aggressively in his next film, Fear.com. Now, to be fair, by straying away from the original, the 1999 version was able to be its own thing, which was especially handy seeing as just three months before its release, another Haunted House remake called The Haunting had just released to a scathing critical reception, and was able to avoid direct comparisons except for its, uh, awful CGI. Trust me, we'll get to that very, very shortly. So let's get into spoiler territory. In the 1959 original, as I said, the supernatural stuff is left open to interpretation because when one of the strangers, Nora, encounters what she believes to be ghosts, it turns out they're the house's elderly caretakers. However, the house's owner, Watson Pritchard, is very convinced that the ghosts are real, and if we don't see them, the assumption is that they're toying with the occupants into effectively turning against each other. But the reality is much simpler than that. After the millionaire's wife Annabelle Lauren is found hanged in the stairwell, her husband Frederick quickly assumes foul play while Watson suspects it was the ghosts. At some point, the truth just abruptly reveals itself. One of the strangers, Dr. David Trent, is in cahoots with Annabelle, who is actually still alive, and created an elaborate plan in which they want to trick one of the strangers into killing Frederick so that they can be together and have Frederick's wealth all to themselves. In the end, a twist reveals that Frederick knew about the plan all along, and set up his own plan to kill them and dump their bodies into a vat of acid that has still been in the cellar all these years after the original murders. Honestly, it's quite shit. Or rather, it's underwhelming. There's just no build up to any of it. It all just suddenly happens because Castle built the entire film around this idea of a cheap gimmick that, regardless of what you think of the story, still worked. And it worked so well, in fact, that we technically have this film to thank for inadvertently paving the way for Psycho and the slasher genre that followed. House on Haunted Hill is basically one of those films that gets brought up by old school film critics as some quintessential classic supernatural horror, but come on, not everything ages like a fine wine. Nothing really happens in the film, it doesn't do anything narratively remarkable, and I left the film just as bewildered and disconnected as the surviving two strangers, who are effectively irrelevant to everything that's going on. They are just caught up in the crossfire of some petty rich people murder conspiracy while Watson is there simply because he owns the place. In that regard, it's quite an alienating film, but I do have a thematic justification for it, so hear me out. In the opening, the millionaire Frederick invites guests who he believes to be individually desperate for money and will more or less go against their own dignity to obtain it. In his eyes, these unfortunate guests who have genuinely sympathetic reasons to need money are motivated by greed as he puts it, but that's an incredibly ignorant and condescending way to treat anyone who doesn't have the luxuries, power or privilege that he does, regardless of how he obtained his own wealth. So when you couple how disconnected Frederick is from ordinary life and William Castle's own personal disillusionment with Hollywood and his financial 
financial standing within the industry as a low budget filmmaker who made it big, you could argue the film is a partial lampoon of the bubble rich people have willingly trapped themselves in. I mean, after all, the whole premise is built around people being trapped in a rich person's home who is giving them money as long as they survive the night. Now, one of the more ambiguous aspects of Frederick's scheme is why he even made this entire thing up to begin with. It makes much more sense in the remake because we do get to spend more time with Frederick, now called Stephen in the remake, who is portrayed as someone who loves to trick and toy with people as he made a career out of it being an amusement park mogul. In fact, it's even established that the point of this party is that it's his wife's birthday and Stephen has the house rigged with amusements to try and scare the guests, but we never see it in action. The major appeal to the remake is that it is significantly more direct with the house being haunted and goes for a surprisingly Lovecraftian approach of having Watson claim that the house is a vessel for an evil entity known as the Darkness, which he describes as a corrosive embodiment of all the violence, hatred and fear that has manifested within the house over the years it was occupied. And yes, it is actually corrosive because it literally consumes its victims and makes them part of it as if it's the shape-shifting alien from the thing. Granted, this entity isn't revealed until the last 10 minutes of the runtime, but it's certainly an inventive payoff as it appears as some sort of psychedelic Rorschach indicative of the psychiatric hospital, but I know, the CG is fucking awful. It's up there as truly some of the worst I've ever seen. I mean, it's contextually creepy, but that CGI does bring the terror level down significantly. The film actually takes a lot of its twisted imagery from Jacob's Ladder of all things, but doesn't use it for any symbolic effect. It's just style without the substance, but it certainly makes for some compelling visceral moments regardless. Story-wise, while I do think they botch the lover's triangle even worse in this film by having Annabelle kill her lover because she's just selfish, I guess, there's not really much of a clear motivation as to why she does anything, I do admire the attempt at adding a larger story around the house, except for when it tries to explain things that should have stayed ambiguous and makes itself needlessly complicated in the process. For example, we discover that before the invites were sent out, the house, uh, I can't believe it actually says this, channeled itself through electricity and manifested itself within Stephen's computer and changed the names on the invites so that those that turned up weren't the real guests, but people who were descendants of the five staff members who survived the hospital fire. Yeah, it's a plot point that thinks it's cleverer than it actually is, because it adds nothing but further contrivance, especially when one of the guests is then later revealed to have been adopted and so the house apparently made a mistake or something. Like, it shoots itself right in the foot by trying to be more complex than it truly needed to be. I just don't see why it's trying to overindulge beyond what was supposed to be a homage to old school horror cinema. So that's House on Haunted Hill. The original 1959 film is actually in the public domain and available in colour, so it's not hard to find if you want to check it out for yourself. But when it comes to the 1999 remake, there is a fun novelty to it with some pretty effective scares thrown in if you can tolerate the acid trip editing that it goes for. If you have any other remakes or forgotten originals that you think deserve a re-evaluation, let me know in the comments below because I really enjoy making these topics. As a kid, I watched a ton of these films that disturbed me, so I'm curious to see how I perceive them as an adult. Thank you so much for watching and sticking with me right into 2021. To end, I want to give a shout out to this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an incredibly affordable online learning community with thousands of inspiring courses for anyone looking to build specific skills, fend off boredom, focus on self-care through creativity, or give yourself a new and exciting challenge. Over the holidays, I've been listening to Amelie Satska's series on iPhone photography because I want to start doing more headshots and media stuff to build my own personal brand, and it's probably about time I put my phone to creative use, as self-conscious as I am. 
In a time of uncertainty, Skillshare offers you a better way to structure your time to achieve goals and unlock your creativity in positive ways. It's about giving you a membership with meaning so that you can connect with like-minded creatives and engage with a community fueled by encouragement, communication and inspiration, which is something that we find rare these days on the cesspit that we call the internet. If you want to give it a shot, Skillshare is giving the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description box below a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. And if you decide to stick around after, it's only about $10 a month. So please consider checking out Skillshare by clicking the link below, and I hope you're having a very happy new year. Now stay safe as always, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!